Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rob and welcome to another episode of Let's Draw. In this episode, we'll be drawing Corvo and Emily from the game Dishonored. It's a first person stealth action game from Arcane Studios released a little while back. Now starting off with, I've created guidelines to sort of pinpoint where the rule of thirds uh, intersections will be, that is, these compositional elements that lie a third of the way from the top and bottom of the page and a third of the way from the left and right of the page. And Although I'm not utilizing these, these spots precisely, it gives me a good ballpark so that I can place my character's faces, which will be the center of attention for this composition, roughly in a good spot so that the viewer's eye doesn't feel like the focal point is too far off of the page or slightly askew. So I'm just trying to center it around these points, not, not lie directly on them, but at least get close. So I've got basic skeletons down for both the foreground and background character, and now I'm just fleshing out a little bit more of the details in a loose sketch. I'm feeling through mostly, I'm not really st struggling too hard to, to maintain accuracy here. The key is speed, you just want to get the idea out as soon as you can so that you, you maintain energy, that you maintain your, your overall focus for the drawing, your overall feel. So basically you just don't want to get bogged down at this stage, so the key here is speed. That's not to say that you should rush through it and that you should just sloppily put down you know, your, your anatomy and things like that. You, you want to pay attention to it, your perspective, all these rules still apply, but you want to do it quickly. You don't want to get bogged down. Now there I'm adjusting the position of the hand. I don't feel like it would have read correctly. Because I do know at this stage that I want Emily holding Corvo's mask, but I want it to appear natural. I want it to look almost as if she'd just removed the mask herself. So I, tw I turned her wrist to a slightly more natural angle and I'm adjusting the fingers now to wrap around the curvature of the mask. And there I'm starting to work in a little bit of her clothing. She, she has this sort of shawl thing going on. Um, it's integrated into the actual character's outfit though, so it's a little... I don't know, it, it's strange. It's not... I mean, maybe strange is the wrong word. It's definitely unique. It stands out, and it's not something that you see um, with your average clothing. So it definitely captures attention, but it makes it kind of difficult to draw. It's, you don't have any kind of reference for it in the world. So that's why I started with the shawl first and then worked my way down from there. Now the key thing to note here is that I'm drawing the clothing around the nude figure. That's that's key. I can't stress enough that clothes sit on your character's body. So it's important to maybe not necessarily fully draw out in the way that I did the anatomy of the nude beneath that, but at the very least you should have a strong understanding of it, a good feel for it before you start drawing the clothing. Otherwise, you won't you won't be able to do it properly. You'll have clothing that's kind of askance or stressed out, things will look weird, you won't know where to put folds, uh, you won't understand the curvature of those folds, things like that. Um, and that's not even taking into account the lighting situation that could arise from having improper forms with your clothing. So although I, I, I don't think that it's necessary to draw the full nude every single time, certainly it helps and it makes it a lot easier if you do. The same thing sort of applies with hair as well. Uh, as you can see, I've drawn out the head, the ear, the jawline, the neck where it connects to the skull, all of these things, and then I've drawn the hair around that. That's for the same reason that you, I drew the nude before I drew the clothing. It's to get the feel of the underlying anatomy and to understand where everything is prior to placing things that obfuscate or alter the silhouette. 
And this is just to ensure accuracy, to make sure that what I'm drawing is actually physically correct. So there, I laid in the nude figure for Corvo and then erased the parts that are being obfuscated by the foreground uh, by Emily. Even though no one will ever see those things, it's important that I drew those out, those lines, so that I could actually have a solid understanding in my head and to make sure that what I got down is correct of the, the form, the figure, things like that. And as always, it's important while you're working to flip the canvas um, regularly so that you're not going askew as you work. It's much easier to correct small mistakes in perspective or things that are slightly off as you go than it is to wait until everything is finished and then have to do it over an entire piece. It becomes daunting and it sort of kills morale. So just keep flipping as you work and correcting as you go. That way the, the piece develops organically and it grows over time. And at any point you can stop and say, you know, show it to someone, say, okay, what do you think? And their focus will be on the qualities of the image, not mechanical issues like, oh, well, no, the, this part's too thick or, you know, it's all slanted or tilted to the left or the right, things like that. Now I'm adjusting the proportions. This isn't entirely accurate because Emily herself uh, in the game is portrayed as maybe 9 to 11, something like that. Corvo is your average 6 foot tall male, so this setup would not really work unless Emily is just precociously tall. So for the composition though, I had to make some concessions, had to stretch things a little bit, had to move her around. So she appears a little bit taller in this image than she really would be in relation to Corvo. But little things like that, you kind of have to do for a composition's sake. Uh, otherwise, it would have seemed unbalanced, I think. Now here, I'm just filling in a few more of the secondary details. And there, I'm adjusting Corvo's line art. So I'm changing its opacity just a little bit so it fades further into the background. That way, it's a sort of visual cue to the viewer that Corvo is not the primary focal point. It's Emily first, Corvo second, and then the background. Now there, those little dots of color, that's that's my color palette. I'm focusing very much on, in this image, on color balance and color harmony. So I'm making sure that even though I've got strongly contrasting colors here, um, Corvo's outfit requires this midnight blue and this incredibly strong yellow, this gold, but to maintain the color harmony, I've, I've sort of desaturated both and I've very much calmed down that gold so that it's really only as strongest in direct sunlight, or direct light in this case, it's not really, I'm not indicating that it's going to be sunlight in this composition, but that gold will only have its fullest saturation, its fullest brightness in direct light. So the parts that aren't will be closer to the environment color and closer to the overall tones that, that Corvo, Corvo's silhouette brings across. And to do that, to get good color harmony, you just basically want to make sure that everything sits at roughly the same intensity, the same part of the color wheel. Even though they may be different hues, things like that. Yeah, that's kind of difficult to explain, but generally you just want to make sure that your saturation isn't incredibly high, which is a good tip overall. Colors in the real world aren't super saturated. Um, they tend to be tinged by the environment color, which for many scenes is either going to be this sort of fluorescent light, which is slightly blue, or natural sunlight, which is slightly golden. Either way, the saturation, the overall intensity of colors is never really that high. So I try to replicate that in my artwork. And specifically here, making sure that everything has this cold tinge to it. The 
design styles, the, the overall artistic direction of Dishonored is very, very cold. It's lots of blues, a lot of steel, a lot of metal. It's a very dystopian view of, of the world. And I wanted to bring that across in this image, but have that contrasted with Emily, where in the game and in this image, I mean, she's sort of representing warmth. She's representing hope. The antithesis, really, of that that's cold feeling, that metallic blue. So using the gradient tool, I've filled in the background. I've gotten the color roughly where I want it, and I've put in a few more adjustments using radial gradients and things like that to sort of punch up or punch down a lot of the colors. And just these are just flats uh, to help bring out the balance. And now on a brand new layer, I'm laying in my shadows. I'm using a cold blue for my shadows. And conversely for my highlight layers, which I get to in a few minutes, I'm using a warmer golden color. So for this image, I've got cold shadows and warm highlights, which is a general, generally a good thing to do. Your shadows don't necessarily need to be cold, they could be warm. But if you do that, then your highlights should probably be cold. The main takeaway though is that you should maintain some sort of contrast like that. And here I'm laying in these shadows on Emily's face with the soft brown brush. Because when you're we're working on female faces, generally they don't have very harsh edges. The only harsh edges that appear are usually around the nose or just beneath the crest of the lips, things like that. Yeah, overall though, a lot of the edges are going to be very soft, and so you'd want to use the soft round brush to just make that easier for you. That way you're not spending a lot of time blending. And you see there, even for the hair, as I lay in the shadows, I'm still using the same cold blue. I've mixed it slightly, with the flat color of her hair to help tinge that cold blue a little bit toward the brown so that it, it doesn't seem unnatural. But I'm still maintaining the cold shadows and the warm highlights concept. At this point, it's still all just shadows. I'm still just focusing on shadows. As you work with this, at this stage, you don't want to zoom in too much because it's not again, it's, it's not about detail at this point. You want to get the large areas of shadows correct first. You want to get the right color balance. You want to get the, the right value balance, you know, light and shadow. The overall feel of the image should be established. So I'm keeping this same zoom level and I'm just working, working through, trying to get shadows in. Just nail them down like that. Now I've created a new layer, and on this I will put my highlights. Now I wasn't too sure yet just how warm I could bring my colors on the highlights, uh, but I tried the slightly warmer blue and that just doesn't work, so I decided to go full on and bring in the, the golden highlight for the rim lighting and things like that. And for the most part I felt very good about it, so that's where I continued.
a simple trick that you can use is that uh, highlights tend to look best when they're, stand, when they're in stark contrast to a shadow. So as you can see on like his shoulders and a bit on his lapel, I went back to the shadow layer and I filled in a little bit of, of that blue shadow color. And then on the highlight layer above that, right on top of that, I created the highlight. And you see that creates that nice contrast. It goes from the generalized flat color, like around his mid-tone blue, becomes slightly darker and then it goes into highlight. Is it, it makes it makes those transition areas really pop and it looks really cool so it's a good tip now I've created a brand new layer and on this this layer will be me, my paint over layer it will be just a normal layer 100% uh, opacity and on this with my hard brush, I'm laying in a lot of the high frequency details. So at this point what I mean is I'm really laying in the final shape, really filling in forms, things like that. As you can see I've zoomed in slightly. And that's so that I can get in a lot of the finer details. Now we are actually concerned with getting things tightened up, getting in really, really clean edges just overall really establishing the final paint. I've hidden the little color swatches that I've created because at this point you really shouldn't need that. This should be it's almost entirely just using the eyedropper to pick up the color that's already there and then painting with that. That should be all you're doing at this point. At this particular stage, you shouldn't feel like you only get one shot at any particular point. It's a paint over lever layer, yes, but you still, it, you should think about it as passes. And what I mean by that is, when you're doing your paint over, just first focus on getting things a little bit tighter. Just worry about getting your forms readable, things like that. Don't worry too much about tiny details, don't worry about you know, things like secondary bounce lights and reflections and all this craziness. Just worry about your basic form, getting everything tight and clean at first. Uh, you want to kind of give it this sort of, uh, I don't know, daytime animation kind of look, uh, if that makes any sense. You sort of just want to make sure that you have solid lighting, that your shapes are generally correct. All of the Lot, all these smaller, more grittier details you can come back and do later, later um, in a final pass, which is generally what I do. But right now, you still want speed. You sort of want to focus on the painting as a whole as you're doing this paint over. So you want to try and capture the, the medium-sized details. You don't want to sit there and worry about things like textures or small hair strands, things like that. No, just get the basic feel down because you still got the entire painting ahead of you. It's very important that you still work at the, uh, the entire painting as one piece, not getting caught up in one particular area or the other. Um, and that's really just a workflow morale thing because you can become... You never know how much work a painting will be, right? You have a general sense, but sometimes the work can surprise you and you might end up spending a couple hours on a small portion and when you step back and look at it you go oh man I'm tired now I don't want to do this anymore all my motivation for this piece is gone eh we'll just call it done and I've seen this quite a bit uh, 
a lot of beginning artists will will do that exact thing. They'll focus on the one part of the painting that they really enjoy and then the rest is just left to flounder and it looks very odd. You can you can see, you can pinpoint exactly the point, exactly the area where they just stopped caring. And that's, you know, it if you don't want to do it, you don't want to do it. But that could have been prevented by focusing on the entire image as a whole and then drilling down. Um, it, it's better to have a, an overall image with unity, with generalized, with a, a common sense of completion, of, of fina finality, of finish to it, than it is to have an image with one area that's really good and everything else just phoned in. So, yes, uh, when you're doing the paint over, just focus on your medium level details to start and then go back through again and really get in those small, you know, those really small things that kind of sell the image, that really drive it home. From time to time, you'll see me flip the paint over layer, the visibility on and off, just to double check. You want to make sure as you're working that you're not slowly creeping too far away from the original painting. You don't want to go off model by inches. So, and that's easy to do. It's a very easy thing to do if you're not careful. So, just turn it on and off and just make sure that what you're painting still accurately reflects what you originally put down. Because like I said, it's very, very easy to just slowly, gradually get away from what you originally 